So what we've done so far is to define an exponential map that takes any matrix in little GLN R and returns for us an invertible matrix in big GLN R. And this map has some nice properties. So it's a locally invertible map, which remember means that there's a neighborhood U of the zero matrix in little GLN and a neighborhood V of the identity matrix in big GLN and an inverse going back from V to U for the exponential map. It also has this property that exp A, exp B, so the group product in big GLN R of those two guys, is exp of something determined entirely by A, B, and the bracket operation on little GLN R, where if you remember this bracket operation is bracket A, B is A, B minus B, A. Our goal is to construct a replacement, little g, for little gln r when we replace big gln r by some other suitable group, big g. Okay, so for each group, big g, we're going to try and find a little g and an exponential map with the same property so that it's locally invertible and this Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula holds. However, for that to be true, little g needs to have a bracket operation. So we need to define a bracket operation on little g. So that's our goal. I just want to give you an example where this really works nicely. Um, and it's an example you're familiar with. So let g be the group of unit complex numbers. In other words, the numbers in c such that uh, they have length one. In other words, it's the unit circle in the complex plane. Why is this a group? Well, if you multiply two of these guys together, what you get is another unit complex number. And we actually know how to write these guys as x of something, right? Z in U1 can be written as e to the i theta for some theta. So what we get is an exponential map from the imaginary numbers i, r to um, g, uh, to u1 that just sends i theta to e to the i theta. That's our exponential map in this example. What is the baker campbell hausdorff formula? Well, first we need to ask, what is the bracket between two imaginary numbers? Well, it's going to be a commutator bracket. In other words, we do i theta 1 brackets i theta 2 equals i theta 1 times i theta 2 minus i theta 2 i theta 1. That's just zero because they commute with one another. So that tells us all the higher order corrections vanish and the Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula reduces to e to the i theta 1 times e to the i theta 2 equals e to the i theta 1 plus theta 2. Just want to illustrate one more thing in this picture. Here's the imaginary numbers, the vertical line through the origin. If I translate that vertical line so that it passes through the identity element in the group, in other words, the point one, um, what I get is a tangent line to the circle. Um, so this vertical line now is passing through the point one in the complex plane. This is a tangent line to the circle. And that's always going to be true. That if we take little g, it's parallel to the tangent line to the group, in this case u1, at the identity element. OK, let me uh, state the theorem now that we're going to work towards. I'm not going to prove it in this video. Uh, I'm going to just make some remarks in this video after I've stated the theorem because um, it's going to take some preparation. So let G be a topologically closed subgroup of GLNR. In other words, G is a group of matrices and 
I'll talk about what topologically closed means uh, as a remark after the theorem. So for now, it's just some words. Define little g to be the set of matrices X in little g ln r such that X Tx is in big G for all real numbers T. In particular, X of X is in big G, if I just set T equal to one in this. But I'm actually requiring X of Tx is in G for all T and R. Then some nice things hold. So first of all, little g is a vector space. That might seem odd because you know, the elements of little g are matrices, but matrices themselves, little g ln r, forms a vector space. You can add two matrices, you can rescale them by a real number. So little g ln r is a vector space of matrices. Little g is going to be a subspace. Um, that means little g is a much simpler thing than big G because you know, big G is some non-linear set of matrices that, you know, it's very difficult to pick coordinates basically on big G. But on little G, to get coordinates, you just pick a basis and write things in terms of that basis. Two, okay, we need a bracket operation on little G. We have a bracket operation on little G ln, which is just a commutator bracket. So we're gonna use that bracket. But if we're gonna use that bracket, we need to make sure that when we take X and y in little g, their bracket is also in little g. Otherwise, the bracket operation doesn't make sense on little g. The claim is it does make sense so that if g, x and y are in little g, then their bracket is also in little g. That will allow us to state the baker campbell hausdorff formula um, in this setting. Third, um, little g is parallel to the tangent space of G at the identity matrix. That's more or less how we're gonna prove one and two actually. Um, and fourth, um, exp from little G to big G, uh, which certainly makes sense as a map, right? If you take something X in, in little G, exp of X is in big G by definition. Um, but what's the claim about this map? It's locally invertible. So we can find neighborhoods U of the zero matrix and V of the identity matrix such that there's an inverse going from V back to U. So this little g has an important name. Little g is called the Lie algebra of big G. It's in general a much simpler looking object than big G. Big G, you might think, is called a Lie group. Well, it is an example of a Lie group. So let, here's some remarks. So topologically closed subgroups of GLN are examples of a more general thing called a Lie group. Um, basically that means they are groups that are bit local coordinate systems such that um, the multiplication map and the inversion map are smooth, like differentiable maps. Um, so why aren't, why aren't I talking about Lie groups more generally? Because it's not true that every Lie group is a topologically closed subgroup of GLNR. There are certainly examples that aren't, but most of them are. All the interesting ones, all the ones we're going to talk about in this course, all the Lie groups you're talking about are groups of matrices. So this theorem is fine for handling them. So let me just remark, there are examples of Lie groups things like the metaplectic group, I think, uh, which are not 
um, topologically closed, so let me just say, not matrix groups, groups of matrices. Um, but most of the interesting examples are. And it, it makes the theory a lot easier if you just work with matrices. So in this course, that's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to focus on groups of matrices. If you want to dig deeper and learn about Lie groups, which are differentiable manifolds that have nice group structures, you can do that in one of the projects. So that's a remark one. Second remark, this phrase topologically closed, uh, I need to justify what, what do I mean by that? Well, the word subgroup, you usually think a closed subgroup is one where you multiply two elements together, you stay inside the, the subgroup. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm saying topologically closed subgroups. That's like a closed set in RN. That's the kind of closed I'm talking about. So let me define exactly what that means. Topologically closed means if G1, G2, dot, 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 is a sequence of matrices elements of G uh, such that uh, GK converges, so the sequence converges in big GLNR. In other words, you have a sequence of matrices that have a limit, then the limit is actually in G. Right, so if it's matrices are all, all in G, they have a limit, then the limit is in G as well. That's the assumption. Um, let me just give you an example of something that's not topologically closed. Uh, let's take GLNQ, so matrices with rational coefficients. It's certainly a group, um, but it's not a, a closed subgroup of GLNR, because, for example, you have this rather silly looking sequence, 3001. 3.1001, 3 3.14001, dot, dot, dot. And the, you know, they're all rational numbers, right? 3.14 is 314 over 100. Um, but the limit of this sequence, if I knew what to write next, would be pi 001. Right, I'm just writing more and more digits of pi each time. And that's not a rational matrix, pi is not a rational number, so this is not closed. Not topologically closed. And why do I want to throw these guys away, right? This looks like a completely reasonable and interesting group, and it is, but if you look at the theorem, it doesn't actually work, right? So it doesn't actually hold for this group, because this vector space little g turns out it would have to be zero if you exponentiate t times a matrix, you want that to be a rational matrix for all t. That's not going to happen like if you pick t equals pi or something. So, you know, this vector space little g is just going to be the zero matrix. And then it's not possible for this exponential map to be locally invertible because any neighborhood of the identity in GLNQ contains infinitely many matrices with you know, very small uh, you know, rational coefficients that are very close to the coefficients of the identity. Um, but little g will just contain the zero matrix, so you know it's not possible to get a bijection between those neighbourhoods. Um, so the theorem doesn't apply to this group. If you want to work with groups like GLNQ, you'd need to work with, say, algebraic groups, uh, rather than the kinds of groups we're talking about. Uh, final remark, if g is just some random subgroup of matrices, so if G inside GLNR is a group of matrices, or a subgroup of GLNR, then its topological closure is also a subgroup, and it's now topologically closed. Uh, topological closure just means you add in all the limit points of sequences in G if those limit points exist. Um, so this will be an exercise for you to prove. 
So in what follows, I will use the word matrix group, or maybe sometimes matrix Lie group, to mean topologically closed subgroup, just because it's quicker to say. So topologically closed subgroup of GLN. As I say, the reason for focusing on matrix groups in this course is because it will allow us to quickly get on to studying things like the representation theory of the groups we really care about, rather than spending ages faffing around introducing manifolds.